Hello, my name's Alex Cook. I'm a historian here in the uh, School of History at the Australian National University. And this week, it's Alan Martin Week, 2017. Every year, the ANU School of History brings an eminent historian from somewhere around the world to the ANU in order to come and share with us their knowledge and expertise, uh, both with our students, our staff, and the wider community. And this year, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, our guest, Professor David Armitage. He's the Lloyd C. Blankfein Professor of History at Harvard University. And Professor Armitage is a, uh, well, prize-winning teacher and, and writer, the author or editor of, of 16 books, I believe, at latest <laughs> count, on a, an extraordinary range of subjects, really, from Shakespeare and Milton through to the British Empire, the Atlantic world, the Pacific world, the Age of Revolution, the Declaration of Independence, the origins of international thought, and most recently, of course, a book on civil wars. I suppose one of the first questions to ask, given the extraordinary range of your interests and in production over recent years, is, is there a, a single guiding interest or, or set of interests or theme that, that shapes your work as a whole? Well, before I answer that big question, Alex, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to come back to the ANU and the School of History. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here to see old friends and to meet uh, new friends as well and to take part in the intellectual life of the, uh, the school for uh, this the honor of doing the Alan Martin Week uh, this week, where we can talk about all of these big issues. Um, of course, I'm stalling for time uh, <laughs> to answer that big question. And I've, I've always thought that the central topic that I've been interested in and it's not an unfamiliar topic, obviously, is the state. Uh, the state as a particular form of political and human organization in a universe of other political and human organizations like empires, for instance. So uh, when I was writing about empires early in my career, it was as a counterpoint to the existing literature, especially in the history of political thought on the state. When I wrote the book on the Declaration of Independence that you kindly mentioned, that was about the process of state making, the introduction of new states into the international order starting in the 18th century and then tracing that process through world history. Foundations of Modern International Thought, which you also kindly mentioned, was very much about how people came to believe that they lived in a world of states. And then my most recent book on civil wars is about state breaking uh, to follow on from those earlier uh, reflections on uh, state making as well. Mm -hmm. So I think I tend to think that I've only ever had one idea. Luckily, it's quite a big one. And it's <laughs> one that intersects with a lot of fields, historical, political and theoretical. So uh, I expect I'll be continuing to mine that particular scene for <laughs> some time to come. <laughs> yes, it is you know, an important theme for anyone who's interested in the history of politics, the history of political thought or indeed the history of modern life. How did you come to develop your, your primary set of interest, I suppose, in, in the state? Uh, but also in particular, one of the things that's apparent in your early work is, is an interest in, in empire, particularly in the kind of international order in which states exist as much as or more than their internal life. I think it originated uh, as a particular scholarly interest in an apprehension that I had that the history of political thought as it was practiced and this will sound paradoxical, was too closely focused on the state as such, uh, that there was a, an implicit Weberian narrative of the emergence of the state, especially its ter territoriality, its claims to jurisdiction, its monopoly of violence, and Weber's famous definition. Uh, and I wondered, this was in the, uh, the late 80s, early 1990s, well, what were the competitors of the state? What other political forms had made parallel or sometimes competing claims to authority, jurisdiction, control over people as, and resources as well as over territory, and the obvious answer to that uh, was empires in the early modern period where my uh, main research interests lay at that point and continue mm -hmm. to lie, the period between the 16th century and the early 19th century, let's say. More autobiographically, uh, I think that scholarly interest intersected with uh, my own formation. I was born in the middle of the 1960s in Britain uh, at a moment of self-conscious decolonization around the world and a rather less self-conscious 
process, perhaps even an amnesiac process of forgetting empire, forgetting colonialism in Britain itself. Uh, and so I think my generation coming to intellectual and scholarly maturity in the 90s, uh, wanted to reflect more openly about the legacies of empire in British history at that mm -hmm. point, so that scholarly interest emerging from within the specific field of the history of political thought intersected with, um, again, a generational interest in empire, its impact on shaping Britain, uh, and those two interests, one more personal and generational, and the mm. other one more precisely scholarly, uh, intersected in particular in my first book on the ideological origins of the British Empire, which was a very self-conscious attempt to bring together domestic British history, the history of the state and state formation, with what had usually been seen as a quite separate field, the field uh, of the British Empire, uh, to see how the two interacted in the early modern period to cross those boundaries. And so that became a matrix for many of my future studies mm -hmm. as well, leading out chronologically as well as conceptually and geographically indeed uh, from that um, original uh, work at the intersection of the history of political thought as traditionally understood and the history of empire as it was being reimagined uh, in the period when I was doing my PhD in my early career years. Mm. I mean, leading on from that, one of the really striking things about your work, I think, that's clear early on but has become more and more clear as, as, as your work has developed and your interests have developed, is, is uh, the interest in and, and also the remarkable capacity to think about big picture issues mm -hmm. and to think about history uh, both both on a on a long temporal time frame but also on a large geographical scale uh, an interest in in uh, relations and processes that go beyond the state and so on um, th I mean that interest in a sense follows logically from from what you were saying but you've argued that it's increasingly important in our times for historians to think in those ways. Why do you think it's so important in our times? Well, I think the challenges that we face within particular political communities, transnationally and internationally, but even on a global scale, are challenges which affect us uh, uh, in ways that cannot be contained within the boundaries of particular states any longer. Think about climate change in particular, but there are other uh, issues coming out of the financial crisis of 2008, which still continue to roil the world. Questions of migration, um, refugee flows, the relationship between um, foreign policies in the, power and the, 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 the great powers of the world and uh, the global south. I mean, all of these big questions are now increasingly cast on, a, on an inter-regional, indeed a global scale. Uh, and I also think as a historian that the roots of many of those problems uh, lie not in even a single generation, but in some cases uh, over decades, centuries, and perhaps even millennia. Um, and I believe, therefore, it's our job as historians to insist on um, the necessity of finding the appropriate scale to examine those problems, to see their dimensions, to work out how we came to the dilemmas that we have arrived at uh, in the contemporary world and um, to use our skills as historians, our ability to juggle multiple timescales, our ability to combine um, various causalities, our ability to juggle multiple methodologies, all of these things I think are characteristic of history as a discipline, if not necessarily unique to it, uh, I think we do have a role in using our sk skills individually and collectively in giving uh, a sense of complexity back to communities within and beyond the academy, uh, and to use those historical skills at the very least to frame the nature of problems, if not necessarily uh, to provide solutions, which may be in the hands of other um, scholars policy makers, activists as well. Um, so I've wanted for some time to think about the ways in which we can link the scholarly achievements of our disciplines, even a discipline like intellectual history, which has been in general somewhat distant from a larger public, for instance, to find ways to communicate the fruits of our research in such a way that they're both comprehensible to wider, wider publics uh, and even in some cases actionable to those publics as well. And that was certainly one of the major impulses behind 
uh, writing my recent book, Civil mm. Wars, A History and Ideas, in a way that I'm, I hope and I believe has been accessible to non-academic, non-scholarly audiences uh, in order to open up the possibility of rethinking key problems like the nature of conflict around the world mm. uh, at the moment using uh, the fruits of historical research, in this case, uh, um, scanning the horizon over a 2,000 year period in order to show some of the roots of our present discontents. Mm. It's, uh, I mean, one of the ongoing features of your work, as, as you just referred to, of course, is that you, um, y you work predominantly, but by no means excu exclusively, as, a, as an intellectual historian. Uh, you've, you've devoted your career in various ways to tracing the way in which ideas and concepts travel through time, are reconfigured, contested, and entangled with wider historical processes. But large-scale world histories have often been um, thought of predominantly by historians in terms of material and economic processes, uh, perhaps broader social process, migration and so on, not so much in terms of the domains of, of the history of ideas. Um, why do you think that the history of ideas matters to those wider processes? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I, I would uh, turn that around slightly and say what I'm now calling history in ideas mm -hmm. matters rather than the history of ideas, as, as you would know and others uh, will be aware as well. Mm -hmm. uh, long range, long durée uh, intellectual history under the name of the history of ideas uh, got rather a bad name for itself mm -hmm. uh, over the course of the 20th century, uh, uh, not least because it, it tended to um, seduce its readers into imagining that ideas themselves had an existence outside the realm of the human, far away from the actors who deployed ideas. So intellectual historians, uh, to some extent, um, became um, uh, victims of their own methodological precision in uh, preventing the possibility of seeing the way in which uh, ideologies, concepts, conceptual frameworks, ideas themselves had been developed because they were deliberately deployed over long periods of time, often very self-consciously and often in the context of uh, unfolding and uh, reimagined traditions. And really what I've been trying to do recently is to reassert the importance of reinserting that history in ideas into these longer range histories, which exactly as you say, have tended to be um, material in their foundations um, uh, and uh, sometimes explicitly Marxist, sometimes implicitly Marxist in, the, in their understanding of uh, what drives long-range and long-term processes. Uh, and I wanted to stake a claim for the importance of uh, intellectual traditions uh, and again these the self-conscious working of agents deploying ideas within uh, those long-range traditions of humanism, classical thought, uh, more recently uh, legal thinking, international jurisprudence, the social sciences, uh, to show some of the ways in which um, we might imagine that we are spoken by the discourses which we have inherited, to put that in perhaps um, soft Foucauldian terms, but to turn that around and to, and to make, again, make evident, make conscious uh, the ways in which the language which speaks us can be something which we can control once we know where it came from, what baggage it carries with it, what dilemmas it's been used to solve, and uh, what, uh, uh, what different layers of sedimented meaning and argument lie in some of our most contested concepts, such as civil war, mm -hmm. for instance. So I think it's it's not an attack on uh, other kinds of um, long-range or large-scale history, but it's making a new claim for intellectual history, the history in ideas, mm -hmm. uh, as part of those longer conversations, which we have been, to some extent, cut off from in recent years and have allowed that incipient uh, or reflexive materialism of global history, for instance, to take over. Uh, but I want to reinsert the claims of intellectual history into those broad broader conversations. Mm. That brings me, I think, perfectly to uh, a discussion of your recent book, Civil Wars, A History in Ideas, as you say. And I was going to ask a question about the, uh, the change from of to in and, mm -hmm. and the meanings that carried, which I think you've, you've explained beautifully. Um, this is in many ways an illustration of, of the method that, that you've outlined, of your call for the importance of long-range histories that are, uh, that are not only transregional and 
transnational, but in many ways global in scope. This is a, a history of the concept of civil war rather than of intracommunal conflict that's charted over over a period of two millennia from mm. ancient Rome to the present. Uh, you, you've chosen within that book three um, key moments, as you call them, to focus on. One being uh, ancient Rome and the ancient Mediterranean, one being early modern Europe, and then a third moment set uh, really in the period after 1850 mm -hmm. with uh, more intensified globalisation, the emergence of new forms of international law and so on. What was your reason for choosing those three moments? I was struck by the continuity of the Roman tradition in particular. Um, again, there's an autobiographical dimension to that, that I went to a 15th century grammar school as a schoolboy. I was schooled in the Roman historians. And as I was reading my way into not just the early modern period, but even deep into the 19th century, I kept finding not, sim not simply echoes, but direct allusions uh, to Rome. So that seemed like an obvious starting point, and I make a very specific argument in the book uh, for why I begin with Rome rather than with uh, ancient Athens in particular, um, not least because it's the Romans who invent the very idea of civil war or bellum civile. That's, that's a Roman term and quite, again, self-consciously by the Romans invented to distinguish their own internal conflicts from those that they knew about uh, from Thucydides and other uh, uh, Greek writers, for instance. Um, then the early modern period, of course, with the, uh, the Renaissance, the revival of humanism, the revival of uh, Roman narratives, um, of political transformation, change, upheaval, and collapse uh, seemed like an obvious switching point in the way in which those Roman narratives were uh, transvalued, in particular in the course of the late 18th century and Age of Revolutions, which was also uh, perceived by um, uh, actors at the time as an age of civil wars as well. So I became very interested in the, the relationship between civil war and revolution as conceptual categories and how a modern narrative of unfolding revolutions uh, was in a sense a palimpsest written over what was originally a Roman narrative of unfolding and repeated and recurrent civil wars. Uh, and then moving forward into the 19th and the 20th centuries, I became interested in the ways in which part of that Roman heritage was left behind. And again, another um, set of narratives, first a jurisprudential narrative, in starting in the late 19th century, as you mentioned, and then a social scientific narrative and set of concepts starting in the Cold War, in particular in the 1960s and onwards, uh, layered over but never entirely effaced uh, the earlier uh, ultimately Roman or Romanoid conceptions of civil war. And the, the concluding parts of the book show the ways in which these successive waves of conceptual innovation, transformation, and reflection never entirely replace each other, but still remain, as it were, jostling with our own conceptual vocabularies to this day. And so really, I think of the book as uh, either intellectual archaeology or genealogy, peeling back the layers uh, successively from a period in the early 21st century when there have been uh, uh, very bitter debates about uh, the meaning and the application of the term civil war to conflicts, for example, in Syria, Libya, or Iraq, and then backtracking from there to show the various layers of consideration, social, scientific, jurisprudential, historical, in some cases even poetic, uh, that lie behind and lie underneath and continue to inflect uh, our own considerations, our own contested considerations of these forms of conflict into the present. Mm. One of the things that I think um comes through extraordinarily strongly in that book is the way in which uh, understandings of civil war in given historical moments uh, are in, in part constructed through a kind of recuperation of or a dialogue with or occasionally an appropriation of various past traditions of civil war so that in a sense as you say the history is still with us but it is also constantly being rewritten as part of a ongoing political context mm -hmm. uh, contests often often with very serious consequences mm -hmm. in the present um, I suppose in many ways it seems to me that reflects very strongly your own broader arguments that you've made in the history manifesto and elsewhere for for the importance of history mm -hmm. and, and for the reason that the past remains with us, but that we still struggle over it mm -hmm. today. Um, you've been, I think, one of the most active spokespeople for, for the role of history in contemporary life and for the need of historians to 
uh, to take that responsibility seriously, mm. um, to reconnect with the public, uh, and, and also to connect with contemporary policy debates. One of the features of your own work, which I think is quite striking from, from early on, is that despite its great sophistication and erudition, it's actually very readable. <laughs> um, does that come naturally, or was that a, a reflection of a particular decision or, or commitment? Well, I think there are various ways to connect with audiences beyond the Academy. One uh, method that uh, we tried with the History Manifesto was open access publication, um, very important means of opening up scholarship to broader audiences. Another one, uh, in the case of civil wars, is to work primarily not with a, a, a scholarly press, a university press, but with a trade press uh, and an excellent editor uh, who uh, helped me to frame my prose as well as the larger uh, architecture of the book as well. You ask if it comes easily. No, it doesn't. Uh, I'm one of those people for whom writing is extraordinarily difficult and painful. Um, I don't find it flows readily at all. Um, I do try to pay a great deal of attention at the level of the sentence and the paragraph as well as the literary shape of a chapter and a whole book, and I find that immensely strenuous. So I'm particularly gratified that you say that it comes over as fluid and readable, because that's absolutely not what it feels like when it's coming down uh, onto the page or, or through the keyboard. So there's a lot of effort um, behind that and struggle. Um, so it's, it's good to know that uh, it does become readable uh, in the end. But I, I uh, was uh, educated from the very beginning, even by uh, my, my teachers at school, to uh, to write as clearly as possible, that uh, um, simplicity and clarity are not the same things. One can be very sophisticated and clear. Uh, there is nothing to be gained from being uh, obscure. Um, uh, uh, I think my goal and the goal of all scholars should be to inform rather to, than to impress. Uh, and if that takes uh, a great labor of crafting well-written prose in order to communicate uh, complex ideas, and hard-won scholarship, and I think that's our responsibility uh, to do that. Uh, so again, thank you for affirming that this, this has not been in vain, <laughs> uh, in my case, at least in some of my work. I really appreciate that. Um, look, it's been absolutely wonderful to speak with you. Thank you so much for, for giving us your time, and um, thank you for, for being part of for, for being part of Alan Martin Week. I know that everyone at the school is uh, thoroughly looking forward to this evening's lecture and to the ongoing series of events. Thank you so thank much, you Alex, and thank you, thanks again to the school for the honour of being here this week. <laughs>